reason for me showing it is, and the first is that we can actually make all of these savings around about uh, 70 uh, megatons of emissions, which for Australia is roughly 12% uh, of our total emissions, uh, and save money. Because we do all of these things that in fact uh, are not a good idea in the first place. They cost us. Uh, so you don't have to have a carbon tax or a trading scheme to suggest that actually people should be doing these things now. It would save them money. Um, but it tells us something about the way we actually use energy, and that is we're not very rational. Uh, the market uh, forces don't actually determine entirely by themselves whether we actually use energy in a particular way or not. Um, it also shows you that um, if you go up to about here, uh, you can see you're dealing with a total cost. Of course, once you go above the line, it costs you. And these things are with things that we can do, the green blocks, uh, to our uh, ecosystems, forests and, and other ecosystems. And it costs you money to do that. Um, but it's interesting enough that that amount is around about 20 odd dollars a tonne of saving, which is close to what the tax is going to be. And if we did all of those things, which presumably should happen if everything was rational, uh, we would actually get up to here. We would save 150 uh, tonnes of carbon a year uh, by the introduction of that tax. The um, other message that I want you to get out of this, of course, is that there isn't a single answer here. There are hundreds of them. And that's part of the problem. Um, uh, it's very difficult to actually set policy that would enable uh, impacts to be made on all of these areas independently that would sum up to a real gain for any nation, uh, whether it be uh, Singapore or, or Australia. Um, some of these things are uh, like changing energy efficiency in industry, uh, cost effective, uh, some are changing the kinds of motor cars we drive, um, uh, which is uh, changing very quickly all over the world uh, to things like reforestation. But you'll also note on here that actually carbon capture and storage, which um, is not a particularly strong option for Singapore, but it is being touted uh, around the world as an important thing, doesn't even appear. And the reason for that is that even current estimates by the people who promote this sector is it would cost about $100 a tonne. These are Australian dollars, by the way. So it shows you uh, one of the things that I wanted to draw out, that in discussing this issue or other issues of sustainability, complexity is a problem uh, that gets in the way of doing things. What uh, McKinsey actually showed in their study, however, was because all of these things exist, that we could actually reduce our emissions by 30%. The current Australian government position is a 5% reduction. And they really have to struggle to get it, political agreement to do that. And here is a uh, hard-nosed uh, economic analysis saying that you could actually get 30% below 1990 levels um, and 60% by 2030. And uh, you could do it without any major new technologies. The technologies exist. Uh, there's something, there's a problem here, and the problem is us. Uh, it's one thing to look at this theoretically from a, a, an economic point of view, but to actually get that to happen uh, in society is another issue. Uh, as I mentioned, we start on our emission trading scheme, um, on our carbon tax uh, in a few months' time, and that will evolve by the middle of 2050 into a full trading scheme. So the initial scheme is one that affects the, the top 100 or so emitters um, in which they uh, have to, they're, they're given permits and they have the opportunity to trade those permits and that the permit price <coughs> will start at about $22 a tonne. Um, a couple of things about this is that actually the commercial community are the ones that really want a price on carbon because they believe markets work. Uh, and yet they're the ones that the moment there's a discussion about setting a tax or setting up a trading scheme, 
want exemption uh, because they really want the best of both worlds. Uh, and I think we've got to a stage now that most of our major industries are accepted that a tax is a, uh, are going to occur and it's going to be migrated into a full a trading scheme. In Australia, uh, some of you may not realise that um, this issue caused the change of a government. Uh, it ca caused a Prime Minister to lose his position to the current Prime Minister and it caused the Leader of the Opposition to lose his position because he was actually pro uh, a charge on carbon and that was not uh, the position of the Conservative government as a whole. Uh, so we will start with a charge, a, a cost which is uh, a little bit less than the European Union charge cost, although I think uh, recently that's come down a bit. Uh, I haven't looked at it uh, in the last uh, few months. So this is all part of a strategy called Securing a Clean Energy Future, which is a nice way uh, of look thinking strategically about uh, the way we use energy and the way we might succeed. But I put this up, not because I'm touting this is the best way of doing it, it's quite the contrary actually, um, but to make a couple of points. One is, the good news about this is that it accepts that simply putting a price on carbon is not enough. You need simultaneously to have uh, renewable energy targets and proactive uh, leadership from government and companies to build renewable energy options um, and there are risks associated with that for governments and for the private sector. And at the same time, you need to be driving energy efficiency, which was really what that earlier slide was. There are things we can do uh, that capture efficiency that we don't normally do at the moment. Energy has been so cheap in Australia that people actually have not thought about it. Um, and water has been the same, and it wasn't until we've just recently come out of a 13-year drought uh, that all of a sudden people start to realise that actually water is uh, a resource that we're underpaying uh, for. And then the last group here is I've added because it, uh, um, it's part of the policy which is land use. Australia is a big area so uh, why don't we actually capture some of this carbon in the vegetation of the country and effectively offset some of the emissions that we're making. And I've left this in because uh, you might wonder what's that relevant to Singapore. It actually is an interesting comparison. Um, if you look at the Australian situation and you calculate the total amount of carbon captured by all of the biosphere of the whole of the nation, it turns about, out to be about two gigatons of carbon a year. All of the photosynthesis of all of the plants across the whole of the country. And we use about 20% of that, about 5% of that. So it tells you even for a nation that is relatively small in population but huge in area, uh, we would have to capture 5% of all of the carbon captured by natural ecosystems in order to be able to deliver the energy or the carbon uh, capture uh, that we would need. And so my own view is for Australia, that we, would, uh, we won't be able to do it. It'll be a small contribution to the end product. And we've had people out there touting the uh, value of biofuels uh, and carbon capture in farms and so on, um, which I don't have any problems with, but they need to put this in perspective. The perspective for uh, Singapore is that if you drew these bars, the red bar would be actually longer than the green bar. You actually use more energy per unit of area that you have than the whole of the solar input. So uh, the opportunity even for solar collectors uh, is limited. Uh, you should do it. Uh, you should go down that direction and the, and the opportunities for buyer uh, collection of carbon or of energy uh, are even less so because in fact the energy efficiency or the capturing efficiency of natural ecosystems is at least an order of magnitude less than what you can get from a solar collector. So interesting and the message here is to be aware that people who actually promote particular technologies often have a very narrow perspective 
Um, and you know, it's it's all right. It's their way of actually trying to promote their product. But sometimes you actually have to do a few simple calculations like this to put a perspective on and say, oh, hold on. Uh, there is a serious limitation, real limitation, uh, about this. Uh, this is the same picture, but for the energy captured, so I won't go through that. The two pictures are almost identical, simply because, roughly speaking, for a unit amount of carbon you capture, there's a unit amount of energy uh, captured. So what about managing co complexity? Now, here is a complex diagram um, that tries to send uh, a message, and that is that if you think about the climate change issue, there are a series of different things that are happening to the climate out here. Um, and there are a series of secondary outcomes from that, like drought, changes of runoff, changes in soil moisture, soil erosion, salination, sea level rise, that arise from those changes. And then there are eco uh, ecosystem responses to that um, that are very wide ranging. And then there are economic responses or results of those changes to the ecosystem. Uh, and then there are social issues that occur if you have these things happen. And then there are key vulnerabilities that finish up on the right hand side. So what is this telling us? It's telling us there's a cascade from even if we knew exactly what the climate change was going to be, we still wouldn't know what our vulnerability was with a high degree of precision. Because there's all of these intervening steps that occur in the way our society operates uh, before we get out here. So this diagram shows from left to right increasing complexity of systems, uh, increasing opportunities. The good news is, of course, the more things that are happening out of here, the more things you can do to try and uh, adapt to the changes that are occurring. Um, or the other way of looking at it is that as you go out here, there's less confidence. You really don't know for sure what's going to happen out here. Um, and you have to, with your risk management process, uh, you have to manage that. So,